Yes, I would. It used to be a sun yeah, porch. I remember. So, I, I walk a sun lot. Porch and, um, Lois Barnes Broadway. home at 83 Pine Crest you know, Parkway, and it is June 3rd, 1991. Yeah. And so this just, uh, interview is being done um, as part of the Pine Crest Oral History Project. So, before we get into the neighborhood and your life here, tell me something about your background, where you were born, and so forth. Well, I was born in Brooklyn Hospital in Brooklyn, New York, and my parents at the time lived at, on Claver Place, which is in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area. And uh, shortly after I was born, the house where they were living uh, burnt, and they moved out to Woodhaven, New York, which is a part of Queens, just across the Kings County, Queens County line. And when we moved there, it was a, it was a two-family house, on a short block there, and across the street there were cows, and there was a dairy farm, and um, it was quite rural. The street had not been paved, so eventually the street was paved, and eventually the dairy closed, and you know the, the area developed. I attended um, TS 171, which was in fact in Kings County because I had to cross the county line to go back to the school. And I, st I stayed there from kindergarten through the end of ninth grade with very excellent teachers, one of whom was a French teacher named Blanche Elaine. And she was from that area of France, which is just between France and Germany, uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And from seventh grade on, she encouraged me to become uh, a lover of French and a French teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so from then on, I decided I would be a French teacher. So I continued my study of French there for three years, and then I went to Girls High Brooklyn, where I met some other wonderful language teachers, and I ended up becoming a language teacher, because after Girls High Brooklyn, I went to Hunter College, more French, German, Latin, and um, then after that, Teachers College Columbia, where I got my uh, secondary certification as a teacher of French. So that was the beginning. But of course, at that time, nobody wanted French teachers. So after I left uh, Teachers College Columbia, I sent out uh, 58 letters asking for positions all over the United States. I received uh, three affirmative answers. One was from, um, I think, Kentucky, one from Georgia, and one from Virginia. And Virginia was closer to New York, so I ended up going to St. Paul Polytechnic Institute in Lawrenceville, Virginia, where I taught French and Latin for two years. It was an Episcopal school, and of course we not only taught French and Latin, but you had to chaperone the ball games, and you had to uh, preview the Sunday school lessons on Sunday, etc. And you got experience doing a lot of everything. When I came back from Virginia, I worked for the telephone company for a year, as um, I trained to become a business office representative. But then they decided to give an exam for um, elementary school teachers in New York City. So I took that exam, and I left the telephone company to start teaching. That was in 1944, and from 44 until 1970, I stayed with the New York City Board of Education, teaching French, I mean, elementary subjects and French remedial reading and Spanish. Well, you know what I'd like to do mm -hmm. is I'd like to back up just a little bit before we get too far along, and if you would tell me about your parents just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, wh wh where were your parents born? Are we on? Yep. My parents were born in Beaufort, South Carolina, which of course has a French name, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess there were a lot of uh, people of French ancestry who had settled there because uh, many of our relatives had French names, Clément and Baptiste and so forth. And uh, my mother, my mother's mother and her mother had lived on a plantation called the Glover Plantation. And of course, after the Civil War, they, uh, my grandmother, I guess it was, married and came into Buford to live, and she was a seamstress. And, but her, um, her brother, was um, sent 
up north to Lincoln University to get his education, and he was trained as a lawyer, and he returned to uh, South Carolina. His name was Thomas Miller, and he ended up becoming a member of the uh, South Carolina re legislature, and he made it possible for all the children, grandmother's children, to uh, get education. My mother went to Scotia Seminary in Concord, North Carolina, where she got a, a normal school education. And um, meanwhile, my father left Buford when he was about 15. He came to New York and uh, continued his education in night school. And among the things that he studied, you know, typing and things like that, he's also uh, learned dental mechanics. And he went to work in a dentist's office clipping. He was a helper and a, you know, odd person to do all sorts of jobs. But he also had to clip articles about the wars and the different political things that were happening. So evidently this person was very concerned with what was happening in Europe at the time. This was in the, you know, 19, 16, 17, 18. And I guess my father became so uh, delighted with the idea of going off to war, he, he decided to join. And he ended up going to France, and he was there for a couple of years. But when he came back, my mother decided she would come to New York. She had done some teaching in a small school down south. And she came up to New York in 1919, and they were married. And then they never went back for many more years, you see. But my father remained a dental mechanic for 40 years and worked on 42nd Street and did very good work with very wonderful labs. They, they did... Um, you know, work for these very, very high-priced dentists on Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, and so forth. And when he retired, they were very happy that, to give him a little going-away party, and a watch, and a pat on the back, and thank you very much. But in those days, no pension had been provided, and because he was a, he was a veteran, he was able to get a veteran's pension. And uh, he had his Social Security, and they had already bought a house, so they were able to live fairly comfortably. And I think my father was gassed during the war. They, you know, they had a gas called mustard gas. And I've seen the uniform that he wore. It, it was a terrible thing. It, it actually took the color out of his skin where the spray had hit him in his chest. And it took the, it ate holes in the material of his uniform. They had these old fashioned, you know, woolen uniforms. And so I guess the gassing was part of his, um, the fact that he had been gassed was part of his compensation as a veteran, you see, because he received a certain amount of veteran's pension. And he later died of emphysema, which I feel had something to do with the mustard gas. This is just my layman's theory. And it also may have had something to do with the kind of work he did, because uh, dental mechanics have to use vulcanizers and all kinds of smelly things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't die till he was 84, so I guess, you know, maybe... What was his series. educational? He well, he had a high school education. He finished it in some of it in Beaufort, and some in New York City. And of course, uh, in Beaufort at the time that they went to school, they had separate high school for blacks and separate high school for, for uh, white students. And um, however, things were tense. You know, in the early 1900s, the racial atmosphere in the South was very bad. But. Um, <clears throat> In New York, things went very smoothly, and uh, they, both of my sister and I attended Hunter College, and um, my father took up bridge as a hobby, after he rebuilt the house practically, and he played bridge for the next 45 years and became a, a master duplicate bridge player. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister trained as a social worker, I trained as the French teacher, and mother stayed home. She worked, I think, about two years in the 30s, in the Depression days. And then she stayed home and took care of the house and the family and the bridge games and things like that for the rest of her life. And she died at the age of 92. So, um, you know, they were, they were not wealthy people, but they had a comfortable life. So. What was her educational? Well, she, as I said, she had a high school education in Beaufort, and then she took two years of college at Scotia Seminary for Girls mm -hmm. in Concord, North Carolina. Right. And that has later become Johnson C. Smith College in, uh, in Concord. And it's, it's co-educational now. Then it was all girls. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean very, very strict. They read the incoming mail and the outgoing mail. 
so the girls were very carefully guarded. <laughs> mm. Those were the old days. Um, how about your grandparents? You said they. Tell me again about your grandparents. Well, and maybe their education. My, I don't know too much about my uh, father's um, family. I do know my grandfather on my father's side um, was born, I guess, before the Civil War sometime. And after the Civil War, he joined the Navy as a teenager. And he stayed in the Navy for 30 years. He started out as just a, a what do you call it, a mess boy who helps out in the, in the cooking facilities. And he worked his way up so that he became a master chef. And he ended up in the, they used to say, chef to the admiral. Now, of course, in those days, I thought there was only one admiral for the whole U.S. Navy. But he was a chef. He was the chef master chef in the admiral's mess, and I can't remember which admiral it was, when he finally retired. And of course he learned how to cook all kinds of fancy things, and he taught my mother how to cook all kinds of things. And when he left the Navy, he um, re obtained a position as, a, as the chef for a, a millionaire family up in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, named Mitchell. The family's name was Mitchell. And it was a, it was a very, very elaborate estate. I remember as a little girl visiting and my grandfather had special quarters of his own over the kitchen, his own little apartment. And then there was another little apartment somewhere else where they put us up. And um, every day after lunch he would go upstairs up to his apartment and have a two hour nap. And there were lots of other employees there who took care of the other things on the uh, mm -hmm. grounds. And after he left that he came back to Buford. And of course, by this time, my grandmother, who had saved all his money, uh, had managed. They had managed to build a nine-room house, and it was like on a 200 by 200 foot lot with a garage and two outer buildings for storage, I guess, and a chicken house and a wraparound porch. And grandmother never worked; she she just took the money and put it in the bank, you know. And my father's sister. Um, she was, she got her high school education in Buford and then she became a she sold insurance and she had a little hairdressing business and she had, she managed the different you know financial affairs because the family by that time had different little parcels of land elsewhere which they rented out and uh, so she collected the rents and she sold insurance and took care of my grandmother and she she never married and so she died I guess when she's in her 60s something like that now, on my mother's side, um, all I know is this name Glover. So there was somebody named Glover and a Glover plantation somewhere in the background. And um, there were quite a few children from, uh, from the pre-Civil War era that were uh, of mixed background. And um, one of them was this Tom Miller who became the congressman there in South Carolina my grandmother, and uh, one who died, who was supposed to have been very pretty with blue eyes, etc., etc., mm -hmm. and looked very much like that side of the family. And then there was another brother, Proctor Glover, who ha became a blacksmith, and he kept his blacksmith business in Buford until uh, he died. Then another sister who had red hair, and she married a seaman, a seaman from the Buford area, and after his name was... Um, I think it was Reed. And eventually, after he died, she moved to Boston. And then there was another brother. So they were quite a large family, but two of them ended up in the Boston area. And uh, the Proctor Glover had a son who came up to New York, and uh, he just stayed. He never went back to the family. He just stayed up here and sort of, you know, how you cross a boundary, <laughs> lost boundaries or whatever. He, he drifted, had drifted into another. Uh, life, and um, but there are some other Glovers I think in Philadelphia, and there are quite a few Glovers so around. So this is your grandmother's. My grandmother's grandfather. Grandfather. I guess. Grandfather's Glover. plantation. Okay. That's where she started oh, out. Okay. So, um, but that's that's the only names that I can remember. And then there's a name Baptiste somewhere in there, and I don't remember just how that came about. But ba Baptiste. Reed Glover were those names on my mother's side. And Elliot, my father's father's name was Israel Elliot. And he had a son, the, uh, my father's younger brother named Israel Elliot. And of course, he was the third child. 
and he was very, very favored. And he went through high school, and then he went to Howard University, and then he went to Howard Medical School, and he didn't have to work a day. What a lovely family. <laughs> because he, they wanted him to get that education, so all he had to do was study. And, well, I think he was a good track star, too, and he went to school, and I think he went to high school in New York for a little while, but then he went on to Howard and now Howard Med. And then he went into the service because, of course, uh, I can't remember which war that was. I guess it was World War I or something was coming along then. And he was a lieutenant colonel in the service, and he ended up going to Japan and wherever, whatever we were involved with over there, Okinawa, Korea. And uh, but his health was uh, affected by all the things that he went through, and uh, eventually he died in um, let's see, I guess in the 60s. Yeah. Did he not practice medicine? He never practiced medicine. He just stayed on the different bases and worked as a medical person. And you know mm -hmm. what you do on the bases: you drink whiskey and you smoke cigarettes. And, and uh, so I really feel that a lot of that affected his health. But um, but anyway, he became you know became a doctor, mm -hmm. and he was he, my father was very fond of him, and he never seemed to resent the fact that the brother was given many more advantages than he was. But uh, because he you know he enjoyed his life, too. Mm -hmm. and he lived to be 84. My his his younger brother only lived to be about uh, let's see 60s, in his late 50s I guess. Mm -hmm. Thinking back to your childhood, what were the educational and career um, aspirations your parents might have had for you? Do you remember messages that they would give you, indirect or direct? I really feel that my um, feeling for French, the French language and the French people, uh, I gained that from my father. Because when he came back from France, he had been a, he started out as a private, but he worked his way up to, a, to be a sergeant major because he knew how to type and because he was, you know, literate and could understand instructions and so forth. And so as a sergeant major, he had a chance to see things and know about things that maybe he might not have if he were just a, a, a private. But from when he came back, of course, from the time I could understand what was going on, I heard about the things that happened in France and the Argonne Forest and Belle Eau Woods and these were household names. And of course, all the buddies that he'd made, the friends that he made in France, came by to visit, and we'd, I'd sit and listen to the old tales. And my father taught me to sing French songs, you know, and Mademoiselle from Armentier and Promenade ce soir. I mean, he'd learned a little bit of French. And I guess in Beaufort, there must have been French in the air somewhere, because it didn't seem hard for people to pick up French. And from then on, by the time I got to junior high school, um, at the age of 11, I guess I was in the seventh grade, uh, I met this wonderful French teacher, Blanche Elaine, and for the fact that I knew about the things that had happened in France and felt warmly towards the French, I think that's what drew us together. And she had evidently had a hard time because they, they left France after the war. And she, I mean, well, maybe before. But she, I think people uh, in a neighborhood like I lived in, there were a lot of German people, and so there may have been a lot of anti uh, anti-French feeling, and she may have uh, been aware of that. But anyway, we, she was a great inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. And all the teachers in junior high school 171 were wonderful teachers. I mean, they were, it was the depression. And teachers were making $35 a week. So if you had a job as a teacher, you really produced. And I think being in the same school from, from age five to age 13 makes a lot of difference. So both my sister and I received very good uh, instruction, and we had, you know, top standards. My sister went to, after she left that school, she went to Franklin K. Lane High School, which had just opened and ended up being a, a Latin student with her name inscribed on the wall. I mean, that's the kind of inspiration. Yeah. So the inspiration and the messages were more from school, you think, from than both, from your parents? From both, from both, because... Do, how about some more from your parents? Well, my mother had been a teacher, and uh, she was always talking about her uncle, who was the congressman, you know. And all of the children had gone to some sort of higher education after they left Buford. 
And by the time I came along, uh, they had named the school after Robert Smalls in in uh, in Beaufort. Robert Smalls, who was very prominent in the Civil War, with the uh, at the time of the um, well, anyway, you, I'll tell you about him later. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Robert Smalls was a black man who had um, piloted a boat from one place to another place through the blockade mm -hmm. during the Civil War. And that was the person the school was named after. And she went to school with, she knew him and so forth and so on. But it, education was very important because that was what made it possible for you to um, rise to another level. And of course, in New York City, where education was free and where it was where you could go to any school in the area where you lived, it was stupid not to take advantage of it. And a lot of our friends by this time had were teachers. You know, as as a substitute teacher, you could get seven dollars a day. So many of my mother's club members and church members were, were school teachers, and that was the thing. So mm -hmm. I didn't stop. I mean, I, after college, I enrolled in Columbia immediately after graduation and went right straight through to Teachers College. Mm -hmm. And um, in the church where we attended, uh, we, we were an Episcopal church at that time, my um, Sunday school teacher was a Charles Keller, who was a lawyer, but also knew French, he was very fluent in French, and when he found out I spoke French, then he would ask me questions and talk to me in French, and then well, I remember one day he said to me, can you think in French? Think in French? It never occurred to me that you could think in French, and I worried about that a lot. And after a while, I trained myself to think in French. Why, you know, count numbers in English when you can count them in French? And then I had a wonderful girlfriend who lived in the neighborhood named uh, Eva Buckwald. She was Jewish, and her family had a, a shop on uh, Fulton Street where they sold um, woolen and yarns and so forth and taught knitting and crocheting. And Eva and Olga, the two sisters, lived with their parents and helped helped out in the shop. And at first they had uh, an apartment behind the shop, and then later on as things got better and better, they got a nice apartment across the street um, above some stores. And of course this was the old Fulton Street where there was an elevated train. So, I mean, this was just the first step towards, you know, doing better. And Eva and I both learned French in high school junior high school and then high school, and we would, in fact, converse in French on the Lexington Avenue elevated train as we came home from school. <laughs> oh, we thought we were great. But we took part in a lot of the activities in the school. She was a very talented writer, so when they would, you know, write these big productions, I don't remember what they called them, but we gave them on the stage of uh, Girls High, and Eva would write the play, and we'd all be in it, you know, with the glee club and the orchestra and everything. and um, But after high school, Eva moved to Baltimore, and uh, I lost track of her. I heard that she uh, had a nervous breakdown. I don't know exactly what. Her father was very strict. And that uh, was during what period of life That you would have been Eva in, in, in I knew school? Eva in, in high school years, mm -hmm. yes. She and only had to go to high school for three years mm -hmm. after graduating from junior high. Right. Because junior high went through the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. So and then you went on to Columbia. First, no, first to, you to Hunter College. To Hunter, and then to Columbia, and then what? And interesting, at Hunter, you know, in those days, if you were a French major, you had to be a German minor. There was no, there were no ifs, ands, or buts. They were, tr they were trying to offset the anti-German feeling that developed. And also, they realized that France was in a very crucial position. That they would always have to deal with the Germans. You see, so I did take three years of German. Oh, I struggled but I managed to survive it. And then I went to Columbia, where I, where Teachers College, I got my master's in the teaching of French. So I had to take all the secondary, you know, pedagogy and so forth. And I met some wonderful people there. And uh, it was a great experience because, you know, at Columbia, you get people from all over the world. So I had Chinese friends and I had friends from Canada. And we, we, it was a very broadening experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but as I said, when I came out with the masters, nobody wanted teachers. Mm -hmm. and so but then you did get the job. I finally went to the, another Episcopal institution I, uh, in Virginia. Lawrenceville, mm -hmm. Virginia mm -hmm. was in um, Brunswick County. Mm -hmm. and they had no public high school for blacks mm -hmm. in 1941, I guess it was. 
and they had um, this private school, St. Paul's, with, was, there was St. Paul's Church, Episcopal Church, and they had St. Paul's School, they just called it at first. They had a high school and a junior college. So it was in their high school that I taught French, and one class of Latin. <laughs> there was only one, there were about six Latin students left, and I had to finish up with them. And that's where I stayed for two years. But I got two years secondary experience because I taught level one and level two French and level whatever, level one college Latin, I guess it was. And um, so when I was able to, I was able to get the two years secondary experience there, and I came back to New York City. And uh, again, they weren't giving any exams. So I, that's why I worked for the telephone company. Right, yeah. and then you got the job. Uh, they gave an examination elementary. For, for elementary, mm -hmm. and I worked on with that till 1954, when they mm -hmm. finally gave the exam for junior high school French teacher. And from 54 to 70, I stayed with the city system, teaching French, and of course you had to teach Spanish and whatever else you need. They needed guidance and things like that. But uh, it was in. Um, a hundred, uh, junior high school 81 and 80, um, one, uh, 81 Manhattan and later became 88 um, was in the heart of Harlem where you had a lot of problems of uh, deficiencies in the early elementary preparation of the children and a lot of reading deficiencies and so forth. So I had many students who whose reading levels were fairly marginal, you know, even though they were in the seventh grade. I really taught language arts, a la French, you know. I mean, I teach, I was teaching French grammar, but I was reinforcing English grammar. You know, you had to know a noun and a subject and a verb, and and uh, so it was, I kind of had, to, I devised my own method of, of uh, clearing those hurdles, but it was a very rewarding experience. And finally, in 19, then I, you know, had a couple of maternity leaves in between. And um, after B.B. was born, I went back to teaching. And at that time, I went to a school where they had emotionally disturbed students. And I stayed there for about a, a year, I guess, about nine months or so. And I got a call from my previous school saying that they were starting a special audiolingual program in the junior high schools of New York City, and I was asked to serve on a special committee of people who would prepare materials for this. So I ended up going over to the Board of Education, uh, I guess it was December of 1959, to serve with this committee. Uh, Milton, Dr. Milton Hanauer was the head of the committee, and we were going to prepare these audiolingual uh, materials in French, Spanish, Italian, and Hebrew. So. Uh, Catherine De Palma and I did the French, and then we had uh, someone that did the Spanish and the Italian and the Hebrew. So a couple of them, we, we made these little booklets and we made the lessons, you know, hello, how are you, You're telling time, shopping, etc., etc. And after we developed that mater those materials, we took them around to the various schools where they were tried out. And of course, the whole 1950s, 1960s era made, meant a change in the way they taught languages, so that you would what was hear, say, see, and write, you know. So you'd learn to speak the language. And this was all part of the National Defense Education Act program, which was to, um, shall I say, to improve the teaching of languages, math, and science in the United States. So it was federally supported. And the schools that participated in the program all received um, tape recorders and tapes and various materials to enhance the program. And I ended up being a foreign language coordinator, which is something like a foreign language delivery man. We, I went to 25 schools a month. Each day I'd go to a different school. I'd do demonstration lessons. I'd explain the materials. I would show them how to work the tape recorder. And in some schools we had labs, how to use the lab. and. Um, just beef up the whole thing and get them to try out these methods so that the children would learn to speak the languages. And we did that for eight years, and at the end of every semester we would write the tests, and then we would deliver the tests. And um, the idea was to start languages earlier, to encourage them to speak better, and to make language just better all the way through.
and then of course to uh, articulate with the high schools where, where we hopefully they would continue their study of languages. So it, ideally you could start a language in elementary school, which was the foreign language for the elementary school, F-L-E-S. You could continue in junior high school and you go through high school learning a language and by that time you would be equipped to go into college language and eventually use it in a very effective way in this United States new attitude towards foreign languages. Of course we also had Russian later on and um, the um, program that was developed in Connecticut uh, went into hardcover. That was so called ALM program. I think they used it in Hastings at one time. And uh, the whole country. It was a revolution in the whole country. So I worked with that for eight years. I worked as a foreign language coordinator until 1968. And then I decided I was tired of traveling around the city and delivering tape recorders, et cetera, et cetera. And I went back to my payroll school, which was on 114th Street. And I taught there from 1968 till 1970 when I moved on up to Hastings. And where, where, and when did tell me about meeting your husband? The first husband or the yep, second let's husband? Do first. Let's first do husband first. I met at Camp Smith, up here in uh, Westchester. A girlfriend that I had gone to college with said, "Well, she wanted me to go up to Camp Smith with her this particular day after school." And I went. I rushed to Penn Station, and I couldn't find her. So I said, "Well, I, it's you know, it's uh, what." 3.36, I better get on the train. So I got on the train, and I rode up to Camp Smith, and we were met. I was met by this gentleman who was supposed to meet the two of us, and I said, well, where's, you know, where's Margaret? She isn't here. So I said, well, here I am. So he took me over to Camp Smith, and they were having some kind of event where they were having... During the course of that evening, I met a gentleman named William Glenell Black, and we um, had quite a nice time talking together and so forth, and he learned uh, that I was teaching in Harlem, and at the time he lived in Harlem. So uh, he drove me back to the station, I went home, my girlfriend never got there. And uh, the next day, at 3 o'clock, about 5 to 3, um, somebody came to the door with a um, I think it was a rose or something, some sort of flower, and said that there was somebody waiting for me downstairs. So when I went downstairs, here's William Glenell Black with a carnation in his lapel and um, inviting me out to, to have coffee or whatever at the school. And that was in the fall of 1945, and we began dating and so forth and so on. Were and you in Hunter College at the time? No, this is the time I'm, I'm teaching school already. Oh, all right. I'm teaching in, in, um, on 120th Street. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, we dated that year, and the following August we were married. Yes, August we were married, and um, uh, he had a house out in Wonder Lake, New Jersey, and a small apartment in the city. So we lived in Wonder Lake, New Jersey, most of the time. And uh, then I was 45, 46. My son was born the next year, and then in. The summer of 1950, Lucille Edwards Chance, who was with the Edwards Realty Company and who lives here, you know, in Hastings, she called my husband one July day and said she had this wonderful bargain for him. He just had to see this house. It was on a quarter of an acre of land and it had quince trees and rhododendrons and roses and azaleas and a swimming pool and blah, blah, blah. It was such a bargain. I had, we just had to see it. So we got in the car and we drove all the way from Wonder Lake, New Jersey to Hastings to see this house at 131 at the corner of you know, the old stone house. And it was such a bargain and the trees and the flowers were so beautiful and she really built it up. Uh, we ended up moving in November of 1950. And then uh, that was it. So that was 1950. But Unfortunately, by 1955, he had died, mm -hmm. and there I was with a nine-room house, 
an apartment over a two-car garage and a swimming pool and a quarter of an acre of land, you know, and the taxes and the, so forth. Did he die of natural causes? He had um, diabetes and all the complications that went with that, plus overwork and everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. How old was he? He was 47. Mm -hmm. And by this time, in 55, I had two children, because I had Laurel and Elliot, El William Elliot Black and Laurel uh, Ann Black. And uh, I was a public school teacher in Manhattan. So um, I appealed to Mrs. Lucille Edwards Chance, and I said, you know, uh, you better find somebody to buy this house, or one night I'm going to disappear and you'll never see me again. So she did. She found somebody to buy it, a Mr. Moraine, John Moraine. And uh, May of 1956, um, I sold the house to him, and I moved here. And this house was formerly owned by uh, Morris and uh, Helen Fruman, F-R-U-M-E-I-N. He was a physician. I think he was an anesthesiologist. And um, they had been anxious to move somewhere else for quite some time. So again, another bargain. And uh, we moved in, and we, I've been here ever since. And I knew I wanted to stay in Hastings. I wanted the children to stay in the Hastings school. And I loved the river, and I loved the location, so I was very happy to come. Mm -hmm. And I think this house is quite old, though. I think it was built in 1924 or something. So, uh, you know, it was... There are still many things to be done, but I'm here. Good. Well. This kind of takes us to the section here they suggest in selecting the house, and you've just said that Mrs. Chance was the one who suggested you come here. Um, where did you look at some other homes or neighborhoods? It was no, no. Uh, my husband loved the grounds, and it was a beautiful setting. And as I said, it was quite a bargain. I mean, under Do you remember under how six much figure, it was in the five. It was in the five figures and the l under fifty thousand. So. You see, for a nine-room house with a quarter of an acre of land, I, I don't know, remember all the circumstances of why it was so low. But, I mean, property was much cheaper then. I mean, houses were selling, you know, 25000 18000 on this in this area. So this was more than that. But, uh, but of course, it was quite a, um, I think the taxes in those days were like $1,800 a year, you know, which was a lot in my estimation. But... Uh, but nevertheless, it was it was a bargain, and it was something that Bill wanted to get into. And yeah. he liked the neighborhood and the idea of the schools and so forth. I don't know Mrs. Chance. She lives here in Hastings. No, Mrs. Lucille Edwards Chance is Judy McGinnis's Judith McGinnis's uh, grand aunt. Oh, it's I her see. Aunt. Oh, okay. It is her okay. aunt, not a grand aunt. All right. Yes. But her sister, Sarah, is Judy McGinnis's mother. Okay. And those two sisters had a real estate business in the city. They're originally from Diana. And their real estate business had prop, uh, sold properties all up and down the, this area, you know. Mm -hmm. And they had come, in, I think, in the late 40s, so they had knew about the area. So they, they, they were bringing you to an area that not only there was a bargain in the house, but they felt that you would be comfortable as a black family. Do you think that's accurate? Or? Yes, because you see, at, this t at that time, Kenneth Clark was already here. Jesse Adams and Alger were already here. Dr. Thomas Patrick, uh, I believe he was here. If he wasn't here, he came very soon afterwards. Uh, the Chances had a very big family. And um, their daughter, Mrs. Chance's daughter-in-law had gone to Hunter College with me. And her son knew my husband from the 369th uh, State Guard in New York City, John Rolea, that was her son. And um, so, I mean, I knew these people before I came up. And then soon after that, Dr. Cyril Dolly came up. He was a Trinidadian a doctor, and he and his wife came up, and I had known his two sons. In this. As a matter of fact, one of them was engaged to one of my girlfriends. And uh, let's see who else now. That, those were the ones that I knew of. Mm -hmm. There were about five families that I knew in this area already. And, it just, and I also I had the impression that Hastings was a very, you know, uh, liberal kind of uh, community. Because I had read about Hastings years ago in the Sunday supplements, you know, the newspapers. Mm -hmm. We always read about the theatrical people, you know, Zigfield and Billy Burke and all the people that lived uh, along the Hudson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So you had been moving, living in New Jersey. You came here. Um, you told me about the house. How would you define the Pinecrest area? Were there boundaries in your mind, or did people tell you there were boundaries? Um, was no, I had no, I had no concept, concept of boundaries. Okay. I felt that this was a rather unique uh, area because of the view and because of its uh, accessibility to the city. I just thought it was a very, you know, choice section. Mm -hmm. It was a very beautiful section. How did the other people in the Pinecrest community react to your moving in? Do you remember? Well, I think there was there was a very warm feeling. The first uh, when we came in uh, November, I I, I had a miscarriage in December, the early part of December, and I was sort of off my. Well, first thing, we came at the beginning of November. The power went out for two weeks, sometime within, right after Thanksgiving, and because a big tree went down on Pinecrest Drive. So we had no power. We had I had gas, and I had gas heated water, and I had five fireplaces in my house. But you know, completely electrical houses were really cramped. So I remember that Mrs. A Reverend and Mrs. Adams invited us to dinner shortly after Thanksgiving, and um, I know we had turkey in some connection because it was right after Thanksgiving, and I was able to cook. And as I said, I had hot water. And we had fireplaces, and it wasn't really too cold, so when we needed heat, we used the fireplaces. And then came Christmas, and when Christmas came, we sang carols at the corner. And uh, that was when I met Dr. Merton, who was, you know, from the head of the sociology department or something at Columbia, Robert Merton, and his family. And all the other families gathered, we sang carols, and afterwards, many of the people came into my house, which was the nearest one, and had eggnog and fruitcake. And then after that, a lot of the gentlemen kept on caroling all around the neighborhood. So it was very, and we did that for several years afterwards. You know, you sort of you'd sing carols and gather somewhere on Christmas Eve. And then the chances, the, the Edwards family that I was telling you about, they live at 114 in McGinnis's house. Off, yeah, they usually had a big party on uh, New Year's, I guess it was New Year's Day. And it, just everybody, you know, from all over, and friends from other parts of Hastings too came. And uh, so it was a very warm feeling, I think. Mm -hmm. And then not too long after that, I guess about 1953, um, Donald, Doc, uh, Donald and Marion Wyatt moved here from, from Tennessee. Now, he, she, he had been a professor in uh, A&T College, and she had taught. And her father had been the president of uh, Virginia State College for, for blacks in, uh, in uh, Petersburg, Virginia. So they were, you know, very enlightened people and friendly people, and um, they had a lot of friends from all over the world, all kinds of friends, Africa and Asia and everywhere. So it was a very cosmopolitan kind of atmosphere, and we played bridge, and, you know, Dr. Philip Stewart moved down to the house there on the corner where the Amors are now, and of course Kenneth Clark was here, and Kate and, Kate and their children. So my kids had plenty of people to play with, and there's uh, Raphael Levy, who was with the the United Jewish Appeal, and his children were the same age as mine. And let's see, well, just generally warm. Alan mm -hmm. Stern, Ruth Stern came shortly after that. It was a warm feeling, mm -hmm. I think. That's nice. That's nice. Mm. Did you have any expectations coming into this neighborhood? Coming into your ho new house? Uh, uh, expectations or or uh, worries or fears. Well, it was a very big house and it was very old, and uh, it, you know, it was expensive to run. It took a lot of oil to run it. But I, you know, things like that didn't worry me. The main problem was the commuting. I knew I was going to continue to teach in the city, and my husband worked at 545 Fifth Avenue in New York City. He was with interstate United Newspapers, which meant he had to commute every day. How did you both commute? He drove and I drove. And so I had to get babysitters and so forth. And I was lucky to get a wonderful babysitter in the spring of 1950, and she's remained our friend ever since. Who was so that? She, that was a girl named Carolyn Barksdale from Yonkers. And she came to me at 17, and she still keeps in touch now, <laughs> even now. But that was the, and then for a while, a friend of mine had a nursery school, so I was able to put my second child in a nursery private nursery. 
but that was the main problem, the commuting when you work in the city and you live out, you know. But uh, once I got home, you know, that was, I was very pleased with the schools because from kindergarten right straight through, my son went to the same school and he did very well. He ended up being the class president when he graduated from high school and he knew everyone by name with the exception of about three kids who came later on. He knew he had just gone to school with them for, for, for you know, 12 years. It, it's, it's a very unusual experience. And he was happy with the track team and basketball. And uh, BB was the same way. She was into track and, you know, the different school activities and had made a lot of good friends. Of course, we met Carla and Amy Bernstein and all her good buddies from, from high school. You know, Carla Mesmer and, no, let's see, who you know? You know, um... Donna. Donna, yeah, Donna, 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 Carla, Amy, those were Laurel Beebe's buddies. Yeah. And she, she had a very pleasant high school time. That's great. Um, from your point of view, what were the, the teachers' attitudes towards your children? Um, they were firm, they were fair, and they were uh, very encouraging. I don't know whether you knew Wanda Sponda. Miss Sponda was a very famous, very strict, very charismatic teacher. And Elliot had her in the fourth grade. She was French, but she taught, uh, you know, the, uh, the elementary subjects. And I can remember one day when Elliot wasn't able to finish his homework and I was home later or something like that. And he was in tears. He could not take his homework. He couldn't go back to school the next day because Miss Sponda would, would be cross and be scolding him and so forth. And, I said, well, I'll write Miss Bonder a letter, you know. We had to go through this whole thing. But they had very high standards, and they kept all the kids to them, and it was very fair. And she, Elliot had Miss Amberzek in, I think it was kindergarten, and she was there practically all the years he was in school. And you had this family feeling, because you'd see teachers that you'd had three, four years ago, you know, right straight through. And all of the children received very good training. Um, and the idea that, you know, that this was only the first step to whatever else they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And my son went to Columbia, my daughter, Laurel, went to San Jose State, and uh, at first Fashion Institute of Technology, then San Jose, and then Columbia. She got her master's from Columbia. And B.B. went to um, C.W. Post and then Boston University, where she finished. Mm -hmm. So I feel they were well trained mm -hmm. at the Hastings schools. Do you remember any um, key, mo key moments or conflicts involving your children's schooling? Oh, let's see now. I, uh, I just think it was the, it, the fact that the standards were very high and that, you know, having to... Um, I was a commuting teacher mother and the homework when I came home had to be, I was a little disappointed that nobody followed in my footsteps and wanted to be a French teacher. We had Madame Reedy at then, and uh, Madame, um, you know, Madame Reed? well, we had a wonderful French department in Hastings, but uh, it, they didn't do that well in French, you know, I mean, that was a little disappointing. But, and Laurel was there in the 60s when they had all the, you know, the racial tensions all over the country, and I think if anything, she was given a very good uh, enriching kind of experience there because although we had the Amsterdam News and Ebony and various periodicals at home about uh, the black experience, she also was in classes, social studies classes, that helped to represent uh, a more um, uh, global view of what was happening in the United States. And she was, she became very, um, conscious of what was going on, much more so than, than La Bibi and Elliot. They were not as, as uh, Afrocentric, I guess is the word nowadays. Mm -hmm. But, um, and Laurel has remained more so. But it may be that it's just that she was there during the 60s, you know, when things were happening and people were being assassinated and all the really grim things were happening. But um, I feel that uh, that didn't impinge on their education in any way and their friendships. And we had many, they were in a club called Jack and Jill, which was a, a, an organization of parents 
which encouraged their children to get together on a monthly basis. So they had a lot of associations with um, uh, African American kids. And we went to camp four years in a row to a, a camp up in uh, Roscoe, New York, which was run by the um, uh, the Prince Hall Masons, which is a black Masonic group, and their Eastern Star affiliate, which is the Women's Auxiliary. So they had they went to camp with African American children, and um, we visited the South, and we visited my sister who lived in uh, Pennsylvania and California and Boston. So they had a chance to see people from everywhere, and you know just take it all in stride. Mm -hmm. Were you active in the school in any way, PTSA or no, I class just attended mother meetings. or anything? No, no. I was active in, in Jack and Jill, our you know, our private organization, and I was active taking 20, 29 credits above the masters while I was teaching because I needed you know additional uh, training. I took administration and supervision and extra courses in this and adolescent psychology and different other things, you know because you have to always keep up with mm -hmm. when you have a mm -hmm. special assignment. And I was teaching adolescents, too. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, um, also in connection with the school, how, how would the teachers respond to you if you if and when you went in to speak to them about your children? That was a very positive response. I think, um, the fa I mean, I made it known that I was a teacher and uh, that I was coming, I usually came with a, a positive attitude, and I, I tend to go to the regular meetings, so I didn't just go to complain. And I, I don't remember ever having to go up about any anything negative, you know. It was just a matter of I went to the regular teacher uh, parent conferences, and uh, if French was getting weak, you know, and homework wasn't as as it should have been, I would sit here and we'd do the French homework and so forth. And and they they seem to. Uh, I think math, BB had a little trouble with math, you know, and I can remember going up to the meeting and trying to help her with it and so forth. But uh, I just, my, my attitude was the teacher is there to, uh, to prepare you for the lesson, to see the homework that you produce after you do it, and if there's something wrong, then it's up to her to analyze what's wrong and, and help you to either come in for coaching or whatever. So as I said, the French, I know BB had trouble with French. And um, and Spanish and none of them were that good in the languages. But I, you know, I can't blame the teacher for that. It's just some people can and some can. And uh, as far as Elliot was concerned, he was his class was in the 99th percentile when they took their, when they, you know, were aware of their scores before he went to college. It was a very very unusual class. What year did he graduate? He graduated in let's see, 65, I guess. And um, everybody went on to, you know, higher. Horizon. So he, I know he got excellent training, and so it was. Yeah, I think it was positive. Mm -hmm. um, your second husband. Where did you meet him? I met him right here in Pinecrest. My neighbor down the street, the one uh, Mrs. Wyatt. Her husband had gone to Lincoln University, and his roommate was a Dr. Ulysses Bourne, and. Um, one evening in the summer, I can't remember now what summer that was, it must have been 1957, I guess. Uh, she invited me to come up to dinner, and I met this Dr. Ulysses Bourne, and um, we started dating, and we ended up getting married, <laughs> and that was that. We got married that, uh, let's see, we met in August of 57, we were married in November of 1957, because my children would say to me, but Uncle... Uncle Yuli comes up, why does he stay up at Aunt Marion's house? Why doesn't he stay here, you know? So eventually we got married and we moved to Frederick, Maryland, where he lived. And he was the, the only um, African-American physician in Frederick, Maryland at that time. And his father before him had been the only African-American uh, physician in Frederick, Maryland. So that's where we moved. And of course, Frederick was going through the very difficult times because it was just the beginning of the integration of the schools in Frederick, and um, my daughter Laura was five, and they didn't have any public, what happened, oh, the school, they had a fire in the school, and she ended up having to go to kindergarten in the basement of a, I guess a church, and my son, he was quite upset by the, the move, because 
there was a lot of tension in the school, and then they had the fire and then all different things, and the teacher had a paddle, and oh, I don't know, poor teacher was probably suffering, going through a lot of things too, but they, they, he wasn't too happy there. And it was a substandard school anyway. And of course it was separate schools. They were just beginning to integrate the schools, and they were going to integrate them one grade at a time, starting in 1957 through 12 more years. So um, anyway, we stayed there from uh, November until, I guess it was uh, June of 1957. And then um, uh, I decided I was not going to stay in Frederick anymore because of differences and problems with the same husband who had his problems. And I came back to uh, New York, and the children came back, and that was the end of that marriage. I decided that, that was not for me. And it was, it was not going to be good for the kids, and then he had an alcohol problem at that time, which he later corrected. But uh, anyway, we didn't stay in Maryland anymore. And that was when I came back. I had, by, by that time, I had moved into this house. So I rented out, I had rented out my house for six months, and I came back and took over my own house, and then we've been here ever since. And Bibi was born? Bibi was born in, um, well, that's it. See, I left before she was born, because I just felt it was intolerable. She was born on the 30th of September, 1958. And, and her given name is Blanche. Blanche. Well, that's yes. my husband's sister's name. Yes. Blanche And Elizabeth. also sort of the French. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. And, well, it was my husband's sister's name, and Elizabeth was his mother's name. His Bibi's father's. But we kept a, a you know, a, a working relationship, and he helped to take care of her. We, I received, a, you know, child support during the years when she was little, and then when she went to college, he paid for half of her college education, and he married a nice lady later on in life who was a very nice person, and she just has a good relationship with Bibi. She's very fond of Bibi, and I, you know, we were amicable. Then he later died of, uh, he died in '83. 1983, and uh, because he was quite a bit older than I was, and uh, so his wife remained in Frederick, and we keep in touch with her. How about church in Hastings? Did you belong to a church here? Uh, I have visited several churches, but uh, my son had been um, started off uh, training in the First Reformed Church. And I think he went through Sunday school quite a bit there. But my, I had been affiliated with the Church of the Master in New York City, where Reverend James Robinson was the pastor. He's the one that started uh, Operation Crossroads Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had worked at his camp in, in New Hampshire. And then I had also been affiliated with the St. Uh, Augustine's Episcopal Church in Brooklyn. So I'm sort of eclectic, I guess. But we visit many churches, and, and all of my kids have been married in churches except one. Let's see, both Ellie. Ellie was married in an Episcopal church, and Bibi was married in a, a church in uh, New Rochelle. So they kept their connections, but not regular communicants, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about shopping in Hastings? <laughs> um, something's funny about that. Mm -hmm. Tell me. VA and P in Hastings is difficult to shop in. It's rather, it's difficult to shop there, I will say that. I don't shop there in the evening because I don't like the parking lot. It's too dark and it's rather cluttered and it's, you know, it, it really doesn't offer as many of the things, many of the things that I would like to get, but mm -hmm. I please you delete, to be deleted. But I do, I buy, I sh shop there off and on. And then the other problem is that I know so many people in Hastings that I end up doing so much talking, I have a difficult time keeping my mind on what I have to do. And one night, I got to the checkout, and I remember it was a Friday evening, it was about five to six, I had worked all day, I had come home, I was shopped, I'd been to the bank, I came home, and then I was shopping, and I gave the checkout person a $20 bill, and she gave me change for 10, and I didn't even realize it until the next day. Because I had, had had so many distractions and so forth, but I do shop there sometimes. I do shop uh, usually in Yonkers, at, uh, an A and P in Yonkers, which is near Odell Avenue there, uh, because that's where I go to. My, I use that mobile gasoline station, which rescues me every once in a while when I need rescuing. 
and uh, it's convenient. But well, it used to be convenient as you come right off the parkway, you know, when I would commute. And uh, but I but I use the laundry and I use the um, uh, the post office and you know card shops, stationery store. And. How did you feel treated? How do you still, and how did you, when you first moved in the in the neighborhood, how did you feel treated by the shopkeepers? Excellent, no problem. Most, most, many of them that I've been shopping with for years know me by name. You know, I mean, I, I don't think there's any problem. Um, were you involved in any local politics? We mentioned the PTSA, but things like League of Women Voters or no, but, anything uh, like that. No, uh, when I first, when we have a Pinecrest Association, which has been in existence ever since I came to Hastings. And years ago, uh, we had, when I first came, we had quite a few meetings uh, concerning the, the dump at the foot of the hill. And at that time, I was the secretary, and we took voluminous notes and wrote letters and so forth, because they were dumping right at the foot of uh, Pinecrest down there on the riverfront. But <clears throat> that was quite a strenuous <laughs> activity in those mm -hmm. years. But since then, you know, with what with children and working, I haven't uh, been active in that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Tell me um, more about the association, the Pinecrest Association. Well, it still meets periodically, and. Um, there haven't been any really crucial issues since then. And usually, um, there have been quite a few presidents. There was a Dick Rutan who used to live here. I think he's since passed. He was a president. And then um, Reverend Adams was very active. And now it's, of course, Mr. Brady. And we would get together maybe once or twice a year, not too often. And there haven't been any, there hasn't been, it's been a very amicable, but very loosely active uh, situation. Um, mostly now, when we have um, situations that arise, it relates to a particular section of the area. And the people who are requested to appear at a, a variance hearing or a planning board hearing or something receive specific letters, and they go, and it becomes a more or less uh, individual situation. And we've had a few of those, you know, because every time there is some building that has to be some sort of a variance people are summoned, and uh, as you see, there's been quite a bit of building. The, the quarter of an acre was parceled off so that half of it remained with the original uh, Mr. Moraine's family, and the other part uh, was sold, and when it was sold, uh, there was a, I guess there was some sort of a hearing, I didn't go to that one, but on that part that was sold, four luxury homes have been erected, and um, recently I was summoned to something because someone wanted to build across the street here, or next to the Capuano's house. And I received a certified letter, and I went to that hearing. And that uh, was um, concerned with the fact that the person was going to build a, something that would not fit into the specification, because this is a scenic preservation area. So I think it's more specific things like that. And Mr. Brady's done a very good job of getting people together, you know, when, when it was something really crucial, but I don't think it's I can't think of anything very crucial now, and I haven't heard any more about the dump, so, you know, that's not crucial now. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost at the end. I think we'll close up for today, and I want to thank you so much. Has it been painful? Or? No, it hasn't Good. been painful. I hope, I, haven't. I hope you will be able to delete anything should, that should be deleted. <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> think there's anything. I've just been rambling. No, it's been very good, and thank you.